using spatula and we take some water then very quickly when it dissolves it forms a blue solution which from our transition metal ions we know is the species in there the blue species in there is the hexa aqua copper iron so if we draw the hexa aqua copper iron what you've shown me still copper iron surrounded by six water molecules which you've charged what i'm going to do now is i'm going to take some universal indicator paper and i'm going to put some water on it so here's water on universal indicator paper let it develop it's not very exciting but you can see that it goes green okay so it's gone green greeny so, if I was to take that and pop it into the copper solution, what colour do you think that universal indicator paper is going to go? Any change, slight tinge, any colour, what colour do you think it's going to go? Any <laughs> well done, Harrison. So, it's slightly acidic. So what species cause something to be acidic? What species cause something to be acidic? Harrison again? We have the H plus ions. H plus ions, can be someone be more specific than H plus ions from when we did acids and bases? H3O plus ions. Fantastic. H3O plus ions or H or oxonium ions or hydroxonium ions. So how the heck have they got into our copper solution. Well, if we look at our hexa aqua copper iron, surrounding it, it's not just flying around in free space in here, surrounding it are lots and lots of water molecules. And water molecules, as you know, have got two lone pairs of electrons and they're, they're polar. And this central metal ion here is pulling electrons from the hydrogens towards itself, because don't forget that's got the positive charge, and therefore these little hydrogens are even more slightly positive, so this water molecule can come along, steer, run off with one, that bond will break, and therefore this turns into an H3O plus ion. So it turns into an H3O plus ion. What is wrong with my hydroxonium ion there? Deliberately made a mistake. Can anyone spot the deliberate mistake? So the CuH2O6 that we believe is causing the blue solution, there's lots of those around, but because it's in water, it hydrolyzes. Remember, hydrolysis is the breaking of a covalent bond using water. And therefore, the water steals off one of those protons, and therefore, it's in equilibrium with Cu, H2O5, OH, and because it's lost a proton, that'll get a positive charge, and that is why it's acidic. It is some iron 3 solution. Yeah, Beth, just for you, being poor, like. So, there's some iron 3 solution. And if we now take our paper, it's really, really acidic. So first of all, why is iron 3 more acidic than a 2 plus iron? And why is iron 3 more acidic than aluminium 3 plus? So if I simply swap that central metal iron there from a 2 plus to a 3 plus, why is it all of a sudden more acidic? Why does that equilibrium move even further in this direction definitely has because we're getting more h3o plus ions ben does the increase in charge pull the electrons like more strongly to the yes. central line so it's not to do with the increase in charge it's also to do with the size of the iron and the smaller the iron and the higher the charge the greater what we call polarizing power so the polarising power, the ability to 
drag electrons towards itself from these water molecules, the polarising power is equal to the charge divided by the size ratio. So the larger the charge, the smaller the size, the more polarising. So why is Fe3 more acidic than aluminium 3? So there's aluminium and there's iron. So why is Fe3 plus even more polarising than Al3 plus? So here is our aqueous metal iron. You can see the water behaving as a base, donating a pair of electrons to the proton. So therefore the aqueous metal iron is behaving as a bronsted Lowry acid. It's a proton donor and the base is a proton acceptor. Notice the curly arrow taking away the proton. The higher the charge and the smaller the size, the greater the polarizing power. Carbonate, she got. Right, so here's a carbonate, and now I'm going to add some of the sodium carbonate, first of all, to not our 3 plus, but our 2 plus iron. So here's our 2 plus iron. I'm just going to pour some of that in there to save some. This is copper 2 plus, and I'm going to put some carbonate in there. So this is some sodium carbonate going into our 2 plus. Okay? not fizzing really no and it's just formed a precipitate now with our three plus iron can you see that effervescence it effervesces why because we've got loads of these around it effervesces and then it forms this rust precipitate so it's effervescing and then it forms this rust precipitate. The carbonate must be acting as a base. We are making some sort of precipitate in there. So instead of the water, we have carbonate ions around. And obviously, if they're behaving as bases, we're getting effervescence and we're getting water. So what I would like you to do is I'm going to ask you to see if you could balance the equation between that and that and obviously we're getting a gas coming off and obviously we're getting what's the rust precipitate and what usually comes off with that gas charge. <clears throat> and therefore the, mo the thing must have to have a loss of at least three protons. So if we steal off three protons, so we take off one, two, three, we've lost three hydrogens, and therefore it's going to become Fe, and it's lost three hydrogens, so there's three waters left, H2O3, with, and therefore we've, three of them have been turned into hydroxide ions. We should have really have done that in red, because that is our rust precipitate. And rust is basically that is formed when rust forms and then it dries out and it does form the iron two ox iron three oxide that you were doing but in aqueous solution so it's lost one two three and it forms a precipitate because it's got no overall charge fe3 rusty and that's the gelatinous precipitate that's formed because it's got water in there as well. So it's a red gelatin, a rusty gelatinous precipitate. So uh, Becky also, and so we also deduced that the gas was carbon dioxide, and whenever you get carbon dioxide, it usually comes along with its mate water. Then she deduced, or they deduced, because you've got three plus there and two minus, the charges have to balance. So therefore you're going to need two of them for every three of those. And because you've got two of them, you're going to form two of them. Because you've got three carbon and H, you need three carbon dioxide, and therefore you're going to form three H2Os. And that is the equation for that acid-base reaction. Um, 
So don't forget there's two moles of these because you need two of those. Two times plus three is plus six. Three times minus two is minus six. <coughs> so that's how you balance that. And it looks harder than it is to balance. Right, but what happened when we did the same with the copper? With the copper two plus, we've got this precipitate, which is like a green precipitate, but no fizzing. And something, this is not an acidity reaction at all. So what happened with the copper is a completely different reaction. And this happens with plus two ions, plus three ions you get fizzing, and you form an insoluble salt, which is like that pale turquoise color. And the insoluble salt, is CuCO3, copper two carbonate. Six waters get booted out. The charge is the same on both sides, and that is your blue, some books say green precipitate of copper carbonate. Can anyone tell me why that reaction definitely takes place? Why will it definitely go in that direction? Due to the entropy. Entropy, yeah, you've got two particles on that side, seven on that side. This definitely takes place with entropy again, because that's a gas, and that will escape. This doesn't form a gas, so the better entropy state is, that's a very poor ligand, you can't have a ligand substitution, it just forms the insoluble salt and water. So if we take another group two, just to prove that this is the case, let's take a... Plus two ions give carbonates, plus three give hydroxides and carbon dioxide gas. It's because iron two, under normal conditions, will oxidise to iron three, so I'm going to carefully transfer some of that into there. So there's iron two, pale green. When we dissolve it in water, it forms the Fe2H2O6. Shouldn't be very acidic because it's a... 2 plus iron, so it's iron 2 is a dick at all, so it's pouring it all over, okay, very pale orange. Take some carbonate, shouldn't fizz, and it doesn't, we form that pale green precipitate of iron 2 carbonate. So, and the other one is the copper, and we all know hexaacyl copper is blue. Okay, so there's hexaqua copper 2. We predict it should not fizz with carbonate, and it didn't. Instead, it gets Well, when he should have said there was that the carbonate. 2 plus ions, the hexaqua 2, two plus ions, are not acidic enough. The central metal ion doesn't polarise the water molecules enough, and therefore they don't form carbon dioxide with carbonates. Instead, they form the metal carbonate, iron 2 carbonate. Copper 2 carbonate, cobalt 2 carbonate. Copper is blue. That's it. Whereas we looked at a ligand substitution reaction. How do we know all of these are not ligand substitution? Well, in each case, you've got a precipitate. So when you get a precipitate, it's an acid base reaction. Recap the smaller the iron, the higher the charge, the more acidic the aqueous iron. I'm going to add some more hydroxide in excess. I'm going to invert it. It's gone. The precipitate has gone. See, it's gone transparent again. The precipitate has redissolved in an excess of the hydroxide ions.